Jim Bannister, everyone, one of our local leaders here of Good Trouble. Alleged to be responsible for 90% of the world's LSD, William Leonard Picard was arrested in 2000 and given two life sentences. Picard formerly was direct deputy director of the Drug Policy Analysis Program at UCLA, a research associate in neurobiology at Harvard Medical School and a graduate of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. In 2020, after 20 years in a maximum security environment, he was released. That's right. Give him a round of applause for that, for making it through it. Currently, he is a biotech analysis for a venture fund in the psychedelic space, so we are happy to have him back. Welcome, William Leonard Picard. Good afternoon, Ann Arbor. <laughs> the center of activism and uh, ground swelling uh, psychedelic revolution currently in America. Ann Arbor. Yes. Most creative prosecutor's office uh, undoubtedly in America, the very cutting edge of thought and revolution. It is a particular pleasure, an honor, great privilege to stand uh, among so many friends uh, to travel from Santa Fe, New Mexico on the invitation of Ann Bannister and see this extraordinary gathering of, of like minds and souls in this warm sunny day and hear these brilliant speakers and the variety of <clears throat> life and thought and heart that we feel before us and around us and within us. Um, I'll touch on three points very briefly. Uh, a little history, a little current uh, activity, and perhaps a reflection on the future. Um, uh, as was introduced uh, a year ago, I had no idea that I would be a free man speaking to such a lovely group as this. I was in a... I was in a very small cell, 60 square feet, all steel and cement, with a narrow slit in the wall and a cuff port for which one bent to be handcuffed to walk to the shower uh, twice a week. And this effectively went on for, oh, 20 years, under sentences of uh, two life sentences without possibility of parole. Never ever to see or hold one's children or wife or family, a career, job, future, income, most friends, uh, all gone, all gone forever, never to be acquired again. That's a very dark place. And there are so many, there are so many still there for nonviolent, nonviolent drug offenses. Um, I trust that we'll look back in 100 years <laughs> or 20 to see that uh, it is uncivilized to maintain uh, adults in long-term incarceration, decades for nonviolent offenses. So it was a great privilege <laughs> to be by the compassion of a distinguished jurist and an act of Congress, actually, uh, a great miracle, a series of miracles, to be released into this wonderful world. The, the first few weeks, uh, I would, uh, frankly, uh, walking the trails in the dry arroyos of Santa Fe, and little rabbits running across the trail, and, and people going, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's all so human and so blessed and so natural and so kind. And I had forgotten that gentleness that we all share. And so this is the world <clears throat> that you all are, are privileged and I'm not privileged to occupy. And it was also, it was also a great wonder to uh, step into the world where I see, as so many have referred today, the uh, corporatization and medicalization of, uh, of psychedelics. I, I'm caught between two worlds because I know both those that are uh, very much against 
patenting uh, psychedelics and therapy and, and those that are more um, classically underground and feel that uh, perhaps mushrooms should be shared among friends as a gentle sacrament so that we might walk down trails in the moonlight or sit around campfires and talk about things. And so, so those were my realizations as, as a young man of 21, 50 years, 54 years ago back in the 60s, where I saw this kind of revolution the first time it happened, although it's not of the magnitude or the exquisiteness of what's going on now. There was, in 68, um, dancing in the streets as uh, orange sunshine, uh, 10 million doses of Owsley's uh, material um, matriculated, <laughs> matriculated across uh, Northern California and throughout the world, Rome, Paris, London, uh, extraordinarily revolutionary times of the anti-war movements. And, we were all very young. There were no elders to ask what's going on. What, well, what is God all about and why are we here? Um, there was no one to talk to over 30. Don't trust anyone over 30. <laughs> so uh, today it's quite different. Uh, we have uh, international instantaneous communication and sharing of huge data sets and files and photographs. And rather than seeing these cell phones, which I just discovered last summer, uh, as separating us, uh, I see them as drawing us more intimately and closer because we can so very quickly communicate with our many friends and expand our social circles. Uh, it's a beautiful and evolutionary time, not only technologically, but in the reception that we're seeing for these sacraments. Uh, uh, Ayana, who spoke earlier today, uh, uh, we were at a gathering last night, and, and she spoke that she hoped that during the great corporatization that's going on, that we don't forget to have a sense of reverence, reverence, and respect at least, for the power and magnitude of the subjective effects of these very special compounds. Uh, I personally am in the... the uh, venture space, so I, I interview uh, people pitching startups for mushroom extracts and retreats abroad and ketamine clinics and uh, creation of novel analogs. And I can speak to that briefly. Um, there are at least three or four hundred startups now. They, they range from uh, things that happened just a few months ago to billion dollar corporations already on the American Stock Exchange, Cybin, Compass, Matai. Uh, uh, their leadership uh, often is very experienced in terms of um, young men that have been through the personal long night of the soul, the transformations. Uh, others are not so experienced. So I would agree with Ayana that we must um, encourage this corporatization, medicalization movement not to be so focused on profit, but be focused on the reverence and personal transformation and gentle, expansive heart that we have personally found, many of us in our lives, and that we hope to expose others to uh, if they wish it. I'll try to be very brief. The space, the psychedelic size space, is getting very crowded with these 400 entities and growing so rapidly. I can hardly uh, keep them on, keep them listed. But we're seeing every conceivable claim uh, as a panacea for all known psychiatric illnesses. We're seeing. Uh, perhaps well-supported claims for um, treatment-resistant depression, for depression itself, for anxiety, for weight loss, <laughs> for, for women's uh, particular maladies, postpartum depression, some gender-specific things, for autism, uh, every conceivable emotional difficult or psychiatric state is being claimed by some startup corporation somewhere in the world. And on top of that, 
every conceivable drug is being asserted as the salvation for that mal uh, malady. Um, oddities like salvinorin A, um, 2CB, 2CI, all the legacy compounds, DMT, mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, all their various analogs. Thousands of analogs are being created now by research chemists in China and India, all associated with the corporations. So we're seeing literally in the last 18 months and certainly in the next two or three years, tens of thousands of new analogs coming out before us. And some of these, I think most will be uninteresting psychedelic washes, so what? Uh, some will be terrifying little beast, uh, like Inbalm, uh, a killer that spread throughout uh, India, uh, sold as LSD. And a few will be precious gems, well thought out, prayed for, well designed, spot on for a specific malady such as cluster headaches, hopefully something broader like uh, PTSD. So the future is most promising and most worrisome. So it, it is people like us that are the underground ground swelling, the people speaking, the people that are monitoring the morality and ethics of the large corporations. There's our voices which guide this. And so we must, you must, speak out when you can, speak out to friends, speak about the importance of handling these materials sacramentally and in a most precious way. In, in, close, in closing, I, I will just end on this lovely afternoon with a question that was asked last night of our speakers. We were all in a little group at a a lovely farmhouse in the country, and we all sit and we're asked, could you describe your first psychedelic experience? And, uh, I demurred <laughs> for legal reasons, but uh, said that from my review of the literature and speaking with friends, the subjective effect varies enormously from person to person, from head to head, from set to setting. But, if one were to describe it, say, if we were tripping now, all together, and we, were just, and we were, thank you, and we were just coming on, all together just now, we might notice on the edge of things, softly, the sound of the breeze passing through the trees. We might notice the silence between words. We might connect that with a person walking aimlessly to the library, with the sunlight on a girl's face, with the coolness of the shade, with the precious presence of so many loving friends, known and yet to be met, the worlds of each person within reach or a few feet away, the world that just opens with a hello, how are you? Many blessings to you, brother. Many blessings to you, sister. And so in that shared space, let us all remember the divinity that we are and that we are creating in this glorious world with much love and respect. Thank you.